In terms of our lunch speaker, uh, Dr. Leap really needs no introduction. Um, I think we all are familiar with his work uh, regarding patient safety. Uh, Lucian Leap started uh, his career as a pediatric surgeon, and of course we all know him from his really seminal work um, in patient safety and creating visibility and, and contributing to the national um, campaign in patient safety. Um, everybody I think is familiar with To Air is Human, I saw Linda actually getting a patient safety book signed. I, I, I grabbed my To Air is Human off my bookshelf to have it signed and, and I grabbed the wrong book. Uh, to Engineer is Human, um, accidentally, so I guess if anything that defines me as human. Um, since To Air is Human, it's been 15 years, almost. And, and so where are we now? And of course, what is uh, Dr. Leap working on now? So I, I'm really thrilled that he was able um, to come share some time with us. Uh, I should mention a few things, of course. Um, after To Air is Human was founded, the National Patient Safety Foundation, uh, which Lucian played a key role in. And more recently, within uh, the foundation, uh, the establishment of the Lucian Leap Institute. Um, and, and the receipt over uh, his, his career of several um, prominent awards, um, in, including the John Asenberg Award um, from the Joint Commission and the Donna Bedian Award. Um, so without um, further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Leap up um, to share his thoughts with us. Thank you, Lucia. You want me to leap up to share my thoughts? <laughs> you want me to leap up to show yeah, my thoughts? Yeah, I want thoughts? you to leap up. Leap up, yeah. right, right. Thank you very much, Jim. Can you hear me in the back row all right? Back people? Okay. Good, good. Well, it's a great privilege to be here. I realized when I came in I had not been to the inner innards of Northeastern University before. I think it's the largest university in Boston by quite some, some bit, but in any case, it's a pleasure to be here, but particularly to talk with you who are, uh, some of us think, the future of our, of our field. Uh, I'll have to start out by uh, saying right up front that I'm going to give more or less the same talk I gave exactly a week ago to the IHI fellows. So those of you who were there can feel free to walk out and skip rope or do something else if you want. But I was just saying it, maybe if you hear it a second time, maybe as much as 30 or 40 percent will stick, but that's up to you. Um, but I, before I start, I always like to have a, uh, an idea who I'm talking to. So how many people in the room consider themselves patient safe, are looking forward to being a patient safety officer or working in that kind of a role? Okay. How many of you are industrial engineers? Ooh wee, okay, great. And how many are, how many are, are physicians? And how many are nurses? Okay, and how many do other things in health but not, oh, haven't mentioned before? And those are administrative jobs or? Human factors. Uh, Human factors engineering. Okay, right, I, I, I was sort of boring that with industrial engineering, which is of course not appropriate. Okay, well, I think it, um, this will be useful for everybody who works in health, but I always feel comfortable about doing that with any audience because we all are recipients of health care at one point or another, regardless of what you do, and so it has some relevance there. I think it's fair to say that since the IOM report, which is coming up on 15 years, we have made a lot of progress. Um, we have had some significant uh, reductions in hospital-acquired infections. Um, oh, I did one other question. How many of you are from overseas? outside of the United States. Okay, good. Um, well, well, most of the data I have, of course, is going to be U.S., but, uh, we, but it's still helpful. But we've made a significant uh, progress in reducing health care acquired infections. Um, we have uh, really raised awareness. I think there's not a health hospital in America that doesn't know that patient safety is a problem and they ought to be doing something about it. Um, most hospitals now have a patient safety officer. They vary a lot in how much, uh, what their responsibilities are, but uh, it's certainly gotten to be something we all know we need to do. Uh, and there have been some big hits. Uh, the IHI 100,000 Lives campaign a few years ago 
uh, got 3,100 hospitals to uh, work on implementing a half a dozen established safe practices. And uh, they thought if they could get 2,000 hospitals to work for a year and a half, they could save 100,000 lives. Well, they got 3,100 hospitals, all this voluntary, no incentives, no requirements, no pay. Uh, 31 hospitals, uh, they didn't all implement all six, of course, but when the dust settled, there was over 122,000 lives they calculated they had saved. That, that, Im that hit um, has been maintained in the sense that hospital mortality has been steadily dropping for the last 10 years. Now, there are many reasons for that. Uh, improved uh, improved uh, technical care, improved care of cardiac patients, for example. But a significant fraction of that is improving safety, so I think we need to, we need to feel comfortable about taking some credit for that. However, it's been much too little and much too slow, and many of us are pretty frustrated because we still see uh, so much more that needs to be done. Peter Pronovo showed us in Michigan now, six or eight years ago, that they could totally eliminate central line infections. That with a, team-based approach, checklist uh, uh, determined uh, uh, approach to, uh, to uh, the whole process of inserting the central line, which is where the infection almost always is caused, that they could absolutely eliminate central line infections. Uh, 68, I have a wonderful slide about this, 68 hospitals that had no central line infections for six months. But that hasn't been replicated at the scale we like. The CDC says that Central line infections are down by 40%. Well, that's impressive. How come not 90%? You know, we know how to do this. Uh, so uh, it's that kind of frustration I think a lot of us share. And so it's a legitimate question to ask it, what is holding us back? Uh, we know all this stuff. Uh, we know we've proven that we can reduce these kinds of harms. Uh, why aren't we doing it? Uh, certainly in the United States, um, perverse financial incentives play a big role. Uh, most of the reimbursement mechanisms and particularly fee-for-service in general work against us what we're trying to do in safety. They promote excessive use, they promote, um, uh, they, and they pay, for, they pay for our mistakes, among other things. And so uh, clearly the, the financial environment in the U.S. Is, is inimicable to what we're trying to do, and people are trying to change that. And I, I'm one of those optimists who thinks it will change. I think within the next five years we're going to have a very significant difference change in the way we pay for health care. But that doesn't apply to most other countries. Um, they don't have that particular problem. I think two other factors that loom large in my thinking about all this is our dysfunctional culture, uh, a culture that really seems to work for no one, a culture that pits professionals against one another instead of working together, a culture that saps joy and meaning in work for the people who work there, Hospital people are amazingly unhappy considering the work they do, and uh, a culture that really uh, works against much of what we're trying to do in safety, and I want to come back to that. Uh, and then I would say the third major obstacle, and everyone could have their own list, and so I don't pretend that this is the list, but the things that stand out as I look at this, um, the third would be lack of leadership, that we have just not had the leadership we need at any level, certainly not at the national le level. It's, Anybody in the room knows nobody's in charge of health care uh, and nobody's in charge of safety for the country. And that's true at the state level, normally in charge, but they don't really do anything about it. And it's true all the way down to the hospital level. So at every level, we have a lack of leadership engagement, which to me is a very serious uh, problem. And I want to come back to that as well. But what we don't have is a lack of know-how. Uh, in the 15 years since the uh, Iowa report, actually starting before that, so there were a few of us who were working on this before the Institute of Medicine report, uh, we have developed a whole host of proven effective safe practices that if they're implemented really will eliminate medical harms. And uh, so we know how to do that and thanks to the IHI and, uh, and the VA and others, uh, we have learned a lot about how to do that in terms of not just PDSA cycles but collaborative working together, et cetera, so that we really are pretty savvy about how to make change, um, and we pretty, are pretty clear about what change needs to be made. Uh, but unfortunately, in spite of uh, all of that, um, we, uh, don't, we seem to be missing something. Um, let, me, um, let me just show you a slide. Um, 
Jim mentioned that uh, the National Patient Safety Foundation established the Lucian Leap Institute a few years ago to, to give um, strategic vision for where we should be going in safety. And we've had a, a distinguished group of people involved in that. And one of the first things we did was to set down what is our vision. And uh, I, uh, I want to share that with you. I'm going to read it because I think every word is important. We envision a culture that is open, transparent, supportive, and committed to learning, where doctors, nurses, and all health workers treat each other and their patients competently and with respect, where the patient's interest is always paramount and where patients and families are fully engaged in their care. We envision a culture centered on teamwork, grounded in mission and purpose, in which organizational managers and boards hold themselves accountable for safety and learning to improve. In a learning organization, every voice is heard, every worker is empowered to prevent system breakdowns and to correct them when they occur. The culture we envision aspires to, strives for, and achieves unprecedented levels of safety, effectiveness, and satisfaction in healthcare. Now, idealistic, yes. Realistic, yes. We know how to do this. We know how to do every, every bit of that. There are places in this country where various parts of that vision are uh, in operation today, Some, which a number of, of them, a, a number of the aspects are in place today. I think of Virginia Mason Medical Center. I think of Children's Hospital of Cincinnati. I think of the work that's been done right here at Cambridge Health Alliance, where I have the privilege of being on the board with a dedicated group of people who are really trying to create that environment uphill slog, but the point is, this isn't pie in the sky. This is stuff that we know how to do, and so the real question is, what's missing? We have the know-how, we have the training, we have the expertise, we have the people. What's missing? The will. Not my will, not your will, but the will of our leadership, and that's what's got to change. And I would suggest to you today, that's your primary challenge that you are learning, you, you, you communicate and share great ideas of projects and pro problems you've addressed, and you're gonna have some more instruction about new methods, et cetera, but the real problem isn't carrying out projects. The real problem is changing the culture, and that takes leadership, so what you have to do is go get after the leadership and make something happen. Your first and most important task is to get leadership on board. And I can tell you where to start. The place to start is with the culture, the dysfunctional, cu dysfunctional culture we have where people treat each other with disrespect and are not able to work collaboratively and well together. And here's a little secret. Everybody knows it. So when you try to do something like this, it's not just you're doing the right thing. It's not just that you're doing the smart thing, but you're going to do something that everybody will support uh, when you try to make it happen because they live it. And uh, if you can make some changes in that, you will have a lot of people right behind you making it happen. So what am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about a culture, as I said, that treats everybody with disrespect. Uh, a culture, I should point out, uh, is universal. Although most of the data I'm going to show you are of necessity from studies that have been done here in the United States. Um, I have had enough experience uh, overseas to realize that these are not unique to us in any way. Uh, I had the privilege of serving on Don Berwick's uh, advisory committee to the NHS just a year ago, along with Maureen Bisignano and Carol Harridan from IHI, and about a dozen people from the National Health Service. And so I learned a lot about the National Health Service, and guess what? It's not a whole lot different from ours, except for the way they pay for it. Um, and uh, they have the same problems. But I also have the privilege of teaching a course at Harvard School of Public Health on quality and safety in which we, uh, it's part of the MPH program, and uh, uh, it's an elective course, so the people are there only if they are interested in the subject, which I very much like. Um, but a third of my students are overseas students. And so I raised this question with them when we're talking about what we're doing, and I said, you know, is this relevant to you? And they said, oh yes, it's the same. And uh, so I have pretty, I'm pretty confident that what we're talking about is a much, it's not a parochial problem, it's not just here, it's not in your hospital, it's not in the United States, it's, world, it's worldwide. So what am I talking about? 
let's, let's just start off with some facts. For, for 30 years, people have been surveying nurses because of the, the abuse they suffer uh, from physicians. Uh, there have been multiple surveys, and about a year ago, somebody sort of put them all together and did a meta-analysis and came out with some overall summary numbers from thousands of responses. And so let me show you what those are. 95% uh, of nurses report they have witnessed or received abusive treatment from physicians. As many of them as often as uh, every two, two, two or three months, almost two-thirds of them every two or three months, Many of them believe it's a reason nurses uh, leave nursing, which sounds pretty reasonable to me. But look at this. Only a very small fraction of doctors are responsible for all the abuse, about 5 or 6%. Very interesting. A small number can really poison the well. Here's a report that came from the Institute of Safe Medication Practices that Michael Cohen runs. Some of you know Michael. He's one of the real dedicated people to, to safety. Um, and uh, these are, this is a study of, as you can see, a large number, almost 5,000 pharmacists. Two columns, have you ever had this kind of treatment? And the second was, have you had it 10 times or more? I mean, is it sort of the way things are? And look at those numbers. 14% uh, doctors who won't answer questions, 11% hung up, uh, yelling, cursing, threats, and so forth. So the pharmacists are getting this kind of treatment as well as the nurses. Uh, a few years ago, uh, there were two papers in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, about, about students, uh, their experience, medical students' experience. And uh, the first one was on burnout. These were, this was based on a large survey of 2,682 respondents at seven medical schools. 53% of medical students met the criteria for burnout. Now, just stop and think about that. We, we're used to, to hearing about nurses having burnout, doctors having burnout, people who work in cancer patients having burnout, people who work in intensive care units, emergency room, great stress and strain burnout. So burnout is well known in the healthcare profession, but in medical students? People who are just, just starting out, burning out already? There's something very missing in our learning environment if that's happening. Same addition, same edition of the journal, same uh, package, uh, was another study uh, which looked at the whole issue of depression and suicide in medical students and look at these numbers. So uh, it's quite clear that uh, nurses, pharmacists, medical students, I don't have figures for residents, but I think they're not a whole lot different from the students, really. Uh, and then an the interesting uh, issue about patients. Um, I. Uh, I mentioned I teach a course at the School of Public Health on uh, quality and safety, and uh, the first day of the course, I give the students an assignment. It was suggested to me my, by Marine Visignano at IHI, and as soon as I heard it, I said, that is really a great idea. So I say to the students, I want you to find a person who has a serious medical problem who's willing to talk to you about it, uh, and then interview them, and I want you to ask them two questions. The first is, what's it like to live with this condition? And just let them talk and let them tell you what daily life is like when you have cancer or diabetes or multiple sclerosis or whatever. And then I want you to ask them a second question, and that is, what has been their experience with the healthcare system in coping with this over the years? And again, don't give any advice, don't make any comments approving or disapproving, just let them tell their story. Then I want you to write a two-page paper. Now, I'm the master of the two-page paper because I have to grade them. And so uh, I say, you know, it's very important for you to learn to express yourself succinctly. And uh, so I want you to express yourself succinctly in two pages. The first is, what did you learn? Tell the patient's story, anecdotes, qu qu uh, quotes, etc. And then page two, what do you see as the implications for what we need to do in improving quality and safety? Seems to me like a pretty good straightforward way to get them started in a course based on what we're really all about, which is the patients. Well, it turns out that this experience is transformative for the students. Um, majority of my students are physicians. They finished their fellowship, some have been out longer, some of them are medical students, and uh, they have never done this, of course. Uh, we've all spent an hour, two, three hours with patients, but we never spend an hour saying, hey, tell me what's it like, and just sit and listen. We don't do that. We 
In fact, we don't listen more than, I think, 17 seconds. That's the number that was measured at one point. But in any case, they had never done this before, and it had a profound impact on it. A number of them said to me, I wish we had the opportunity to do this when we were students or residents anyway. But it had even a more transforming impact on me because I got to read all of them. And if you take out the overseas students, and I just do this so I can talk about the United States, but they're not really any different, so maybe I shouldn't take them out. Uh, here is um, the first year we did this, uh, 41 interviews of American uh, patients. 30 of them had had an experience that you'd be ashamed about. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't three-fourths of their care, uh, but they, they had had interactions with at least one physician, sometimes a nurse, um, that really, uh, that really uh, left them with a very bad feeling. Lots of problems, as you would expect, with care coordination, knowing what's going on, but what struck me was the way physicians treated them in such a disrespectful way. Wouldn't listen, wouldn't explain, wouldn't return phone calls, treated them um, in a demeaning and disrespectful way. So the evidence seems pretty clear to me. I didn't do any of these studies. Uh, the evidence seems pretty clear to me that we are equal opportunity disrespectors. We treat each other with disrespect. Uh, we treat our students with disrespect. We treat our patients with disrespect. And I think we have a very fundamental problem, and I would suggest to you that that's the, whole, the big problem that we need to deal with. Uh, a couple years ago, I convened a group of uh, le uh, educational leaders and, and uh, thought leaders at Harvard Medical School and said, you know, we got a problem here. I showed them the data, and I said, do you want to do something about it? And I said, I'm not, I'm, I'm not really interested in meeting every, every month to talk about it. I, I'm interested in what we can do about it. Are you interested? And they all said yes. Of course, what are you going to say, no? But in any case, uh, they, they, we, we, we met together and got the data together and, and talked about it and decided that we really needed to write a white paper to c communicate to uh, just our Harvard community about what needs to be done. And when we got the paper done, uh, somebody said, well, we ought to publish this. And I said, sure. What journal is going to publish a 40-page paper? And they said, well, try academic medicine. Well, it turns out academic medicine was interested, and they split it into two papers. So here they are. Um, by the way, my slides are available afterwards. I'll, I'll leave them on the computer so you don't need to take notes or anything. You can get that. But these, are, these came out in academic medicine just, just exactly two years ago, uh, well, July of, of, of 2012. And uh, so it's in two parts. Uh, what's going on, and then what can we do about it. And what I'd like to do for the next 20 minutes is boil down these two papers into some take-home messages that you'll find useful and make it easy to remember. We classified disrespect into six different categories. Well, I'm going to make it down to three, which makes it a little easier rec uh, to remember, and also has, uh, will help you, I think, uh, it helps me understand it better. So uh, wh what I would suggest is that the spectrum of disrespect that we're talking about um, covers three areas that are really very different. Overt disrespectful treatment, disruptive conduct, the kind of stuff that we all, when, when you say disrespect, what people think is the dis disruptive physician, the surgeon that throws instruments or the doctor shouts at people and, and really uh, insults the nurse and so forth. And uh, that's certainly a, 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 a significant problem. So one group is, is that group, what I call overt disrespect. These are people who really hurt other people. That is, their actions, their actions may or may not be intended to hurt people. I, I can't get into their heads about what their intents are, but the, the effect is to hurt people and to really, really hurt people a great deal. Uh, all, all people, nurses, residents, students, patients, et cetera, each other. Uh, the second group is uh, what we call covert, and that is these are not people these are people who are not hurting other people. They don't wish to, and they don't. Uh, they just uh, uh, have uh, disrespect in another way, and I want to come back to that. And then the third category, which uh, was news to us, we had never even thought of this, frankly, is what we now call institutionalized or normalized disrespect, and I want to explain that in, uh, for, your, for your consideration. So let's start with the overt. As I said, what most people think of as the disruptive physician, the person who humiliates other people. Now, I've given versions of this uh, talk to various groups, particularly in the Boston area, of Grand Rounds at most of the Harvard teaching hospitals and different services, et cetera, as well as to national groups, including large meetings of nurses, et cetera. And what I like to do, which I will not do to you, um, is uh, uh, poll them for, for what they think about things. If we have a, a turning point or something, we can use the little clickers, we can get numbers. Otherwise, people, as people put up their hands, 
People aren't shy about putting up their hands, which I think is kind of interesting. But in any case, uh, what I'll show you is some of the questions I ask, and then I'll show you what the responses are from the ones that I had measurements of from through, through turning points or something like that. So one of the first questions is to say to the audience, do you agree? In the past three months, I've been the victim of or witnessed disruptive or humiliating behavior. Think for a minute what your answer to that would be in your institution. Well, here's what we get from uh, a, a pooling of uh, a, about eight or ten uh, uh, different groups that are mixed, usually nurses, doctors, students, and others. About 55, but notice if you just go to nurse groups, I've, I've, I've talked before a couple large groups of nurses, their number is quite a bit higher. Um, and then there's the, the other part of the overt uh, disrespect is the degrading put-downs, in which, you know, they aren't shouting at people, they aren't really humiliating them, but they're treating them pretty badly. And this, of course, is what patients are most likely to receive. Now, let me stress again, this is not the vast majority of doctors. This is probably a very small percentage. The nursing surveys indicate it's less than 6%. But that small number has an incredibly powerful impact on a wide circle of people. It really is like a pebble in the pond in terms of what it does. Um, now the second group of covert or passive resistance is the whole, the whole uh, bunch of people who uh, really just don't want to play. Uh, I didn't go to medical school to be on committees and teams. I went to learn how to take care of patients. I studied hard. I'm an expert at that, I'm very conscientious, I know how to do it, I don't need your advice, thank you very much. Uh, they're, not, they're not particularly hostile, they don't treat people badly, they just don't want to play. So they're the whole group of the autonomy nuts, people who really, when you get right down to it, just don't value other people's opinion. Yes, I know the American College of Cardiology guidelines say that, but I don't happen to agree with that, and therefore I'm not going to do it. Uh, these are people who tend to sort of you know, th th they're there, it means, because you have to be, uh, but they're clearly uh, not interested. They are typically come late, they're bored. Uh, these are people who don't get their discharge summaries done, all that kind of stuff. Um, but the most important thing is that they really won't participate in safe practices, not only not to develop them as members of the teams, the quality improvement and safety teams, but they also don't even think they necessarily have to follow them. And that gets to in another area. So uh, a whole bunch of behavior, and let me just make a really sweeping generalization, and if you think I'm wrong, that's fine, and maybe I am. I think the majority of doctors are in this category. I think the majority of doctors are in this category. That most hospitals that I know, with the exception of the Virginia Mason, the Mayo, and Children's Hospital, and so very, a very small percentage of physicians really participate in the quality and safety activities. And indeed, when you talk to people who work in this, they will tell you, people from IHI and others, the major cause of failure of quality improvement projects is lack of physician participation. Whether you like them or not, whether you agree with them or not, physicians are the key players in hospitals. I'm sorry, that's the way it is, that's the way it'll always be. Now let's try to make them somebody we can work with. Uh, I are one, so I can speak to that. I was a surgeon for 25 years and I treated some people badly, I realize now. I'm reformed, but uh, the fact of the matter is the majority of physicians really are, I think, still in the non-play mode, uh, and that's a real challenge for us. So I, when I make all those statements, then I turn to the audience and say, well, what do you say to this? Some doctors feel the rules don't apply to them. In my hospital, people are held accountable for safety, if they deliberately violate a safe practice, like refuse to wash their hands, they are punished. Well, not so much, not so much. Nurses get punished, but doctors don't get punished much. Punished, that's a bad word. We always talked about a, a non-punitive environment. And let's be clear about that. <clears throat> Let me take a little digression. The heart of the patient safety movement is, this, is this, when we said, quit punishing people for making errors. People don't make errors because they're bad. Uh, they make errors because they're working in bad systems. So quit punishing people and fix the systems. That was the IOM message. And that's what we've been trying to do for 15 years. So we're very clear that errors are not misconduct. Uh, and you should never 
never underline capital letters, Lucian Leaf said it, never punish for errors. That's very different from misconduct. Misconduct is the conduct is the deliberate refusal to follow a safe practice. That should have consequences. You should be held accountable. And uh, we're talking about just exactly that, and what you see is we don't do that. Uh, in my hospital, many doctors do not participate in quality improvement safety initiative. I just made that statement to you. Well, how many people agree with that? Well, 55% overall, nurses would say 68%. My hunch is the nurses uh, report is probably more reliable because the mixed report is doctors and nurses, and of course they, oh yeah, yeah, we're doing all that sort of stuff. So uh, I think I'd go with the nurses' judgment on that. So two-thirds of the hospitals, they feel the doctors don't participate. What did I say? About two-thirds. About it. Many good doctors are not good team players. Oh boy, big surprise, absolutely. And again, nurses, the ones that have to be the team players, uh, over three-fourths would agree with that statement. So I've just given you a bunch of generalizations. All I can say is there's a lot of people who agree with me. <laughs> and you can make up your own mind. Now the last category uh, I find fascinating, uh, mostly because it never occurred to me before, so it was fascinating. Uh, and we're talking about what I would call baked in uh, or, or institutionalized respect, sort of part of, the every, part of our everyday life. This is the way things are. It's the way we do things, and that's the way it's always been, and it's the way it always will be, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we can break it into two categories, uh, the kinds of disrespect that affect us, those who work in the healthcare system, the doctors and nurses, technicians, pharmacists, all of us, and then what we do that affects our patients. So I want to look at them separately because the issues are, are separate. So in terms of, uh, of us, the workers, the first thing that comes up is physical disrespect. Uh, you may or may not know much about this, um, but uh, healthcare happens to be uh, the most hazardous uh, industry in the country with the exception perhaps of mining for coal. Uh, and I have some data for this. This is released, released by OSHA just a few months ago. And here you are that the hospital lost days due to injury rate. The, the metric that's used for this is uh, a, a, a worker doesn't come to work that day because of injuries. And so a lost day of work per 100, uh, 100 10,000 full-time employees in a year. The annual number of lost days for 10,000 employees. And the number for hospitals, as you can see, is over 50% greater than private industry overall. But look at this. When you look, if you do a little fine-grained dissection of that, Look at this. It's nurses have about a 25% higher rate, 128 over 100. But look at the nursing aides and orderlies. Four times the rate of industry across the board. We're talking about needle sticks. We're talking about back strain. We're talking about slips and falls. We're talking about assaults. All these things that happen to people who work in hospitals. And we just sort of say, well, that's the way it is. If you're going to work in healthcare, you just have to be, you have to just uh, be willing to to accept there's a hazard. Well, that's BS, folks. These can all be eliminated. These can all be eliminated. You don't have to have needle sticks. You don't have to have back strains. We, have, we know how to do this. There are hospitals that have eliminated those. This is back to the business about we have the know-how but don't have the will. But this is really a disgrace. This is a, a national disgrace that the people who are working, committed, hardworking, everybody works more than eight hours, many of them work more than 12, hardworking, committed, dedicated, intelligent, competent people who uh, are really uh, being hurt by their job, and it's unnecessary. Work hours and workloads also fit in this category, and these are very inflammatory subjects. Uh, the whole idea of limiting resident hours, uh, not letting them work after they've been up all night or not even letting them be up all night, has been uh, just a, a flashpoint. It's right up there with the abortion argument, I think. I mean, it's one of those kind of things where people have very definite ideas on, you can't barely get them to talk to each other about it. But it has been something else uh, to watch what's happened on that, and something that to some of us, and I'm sure it's true of all the engineers in the room, is such a, it's a no-brainer. And when Chuck Seisler at the Brigham uh, said to me he was going to do a study in residence to show the effect of sleep deprivation on their performance. And I said, why do you have to do that? Everybody knows you make more mistakes when you're tired. He said, well, nobody believes it. So he had got residents to walk around with electrodes on their head and keep notes of what they were doing and so forth. And 
big surprise. Uh, when they were, when they'd been up all night, they made more mistakes. They made more mistakes that hurt people. They made more mistakes that killed people. They also were more at risk of having an automobile accident when they were driving home. They were more at risk of dying in an automobile accident while driving home after being up all night. What the hell do we need to do to get people to understand this is a problem? As I said, I'm not going to go there, except to say one thing. And that is, we now know this. We have Seisler's work, we have other people's work, and the same goes to workloads for nursing. Linda Aiken's great work at the University of Pennsylvania and others show that, that when a nurse has more patients to take care of than he or she is able to, they make more mistakes. Of course they do. They cut corners to get the patients taken care of. Of course they make more mistakes. They're trying to get the people taken care of. So we know that. And what I'm saying to you is this, that with the data are in, we know without any question that when you're sleep deprived, you're going to be more likely to hurt people and kill them. And when you have too many patients to take care of, doctors or nurses who have too many patients to take care of, you're more likely to harm them. So when you know that, and you could say 10 years ago we didn't know that, but that's not true now, then when you specifically, directly, and explicitly ask somebody to do that, you are treating them with disrespect. I would suggest maybe the maximum disrespect putting some, knowingly, underlying knowingly, putting a person in a situation where you know they are more likely to hurt somebody. We don't have the right to do that, folks. That's basically wrong. I mean, we're talking about right and wrong here. It's, it's really not very complicated. I told you the business about uh, my uh, students interviewing patients and what they found, but there are some sort of uh, structural, or uh, I guess that's the right word, structural things we do um, that uh, also re come in the same category. One of them is the whole issue of decision making. Uh, there's, a whole, there's a whole group uh, uh, dedicated to shared decision making. And for those of you that are not familiar that, with this, that it, it's really quite simple. What it says is, I as a patient have the right to know what my options are and what the consequences of all of them. So if I have a medical decision to make, a treatment for whatever, uh, then the physician has an obligation to explain to me in ways that I can understand. And I was a doctor for 25 years, and I believe you can explain anything to anybody. I was a pediatric surgeon and operated on babies with complex congenital malformations, and I like to believe that the, patients under the parents understood what we were doing. We certainly tried very hard to do that. Uh, but in any case, um, uh, the physician has an obligation to say, here are the options, and here are the pros and the cons for each option, and here are the results of the treatment for each option, so an individual can decide. In the classic case that's been worked on a lot, uh, and they have even have uh, CD, uh, DVDs uh, sh about this which are helpful, is uh, uh, cancer of the prostate. Cancer of the prostate is, I think, the number one cancer killer of men, as I recall. Anyway, it's a, up there. Uh, and there are, there are basically three options. You can take it out, radical prostatectomy, and that always appeals to people. You know, get rid of that cancer. I don't want to have me. Uh, so take it out, uh, treat it with radiation, or uh, watchful waiting. It turns out that most prostate cancers don't kill you. Uh, so you can watch it and see if it's getting worse and then treat it. Um, and what I'm suggesting to you is the average patient in the average medical practice in an average town in America, uh, when, the, when, when the PSA comes back and the, the, the primary care physician sends them to the urologist and they do a biopsy and it comes back cancer of the prostate, the urologist then tells them what the options are. And what they usually say is you need to have your prostate out, we can do it next Wednesday. Uh, that's a bit of a character, but not too much. And uh, so what we're really talking about is patients really have the right, clearly, um, but clearly it's in the interest of everybody, for them to have real, a real understanding. And, and we need to realize it's a patient's decision. We're there to offer our expert advice, but we're there to help people do what's the right thing. The same kind of thing comes into, into play in spades in end-of-life care, where you get into futile treatment and that sort of thing. And you have to step back and say, whose life is it anyhow? And whose decision is it anyhow? And that's a big change, because that's not the way we were brought up. We were brought up to be paternalistic and to tell people what needed, because we knew so much more than they did. Uh, we're saying that's not right. Uh, a second is a, a much simpler thing, but 
just think about any yourself or friends or family who've been in the hospital, how often you'd go in to visit them and they didn't know what was gonna happen that day because nobody tells them. Oh, I think I'm supposed to get an x-ray test or something. Um, how is it that in this day and age, <coughs> excuse me, with computers and everything that are so wonderful, why can't a patient get in the hospital, get a, a, a list that says, here are your medications. Here's, here are the medications you get at eight, here are the ones you get at 12, here's the ones you get at four, and list them and what they're for. And, and, and then right next to it, have a little picture of the pill. PDR has the pictures, they're on, I mean, they're on my computer, I suppose, somewhere. <laughs> uh, you can just take a picture and print it in color on the thing, and so the patient would say, here, there it is. And so the nurse comes in and says, well, hi, Mrs. Jones, here's your, I'm here to give you your eight o'clock medication. And you say, you know, I don't take an orange pill. Must be Mrs. Smith, I'm so sorry. So, I mean, it's simple. I'm not saying patients are responsible for medication safety, of course not. I'm just saying, why can't we be participants in our care? This is called partnering. It's called patient engagement. It's, car it's called realizing we're there to serve patients, not the other way around. We got a long way to go on that. The whole issue of disclosure and apology, uh, I could spend an hour and a half uh, talking about that, and I won't, but to say that, that that's exactly what this is about. Clearly, the patient has a right to know everything that we know about them, everything, good and bad beautiful and ugly. And, uh, and when we hurt them, they certainly are entitled to an apology and compensation. And then little things like uh, greetings and how people are treated. Uh, I can summarize this in a very simple statement, and that is, you know you have a problem when the checkout person at Shaw's is nicer to you than the check-in person in the clinic. Uh, when I go to Shaw's, the person always says, good afternoon, how are you today? And when I leave, they say, thank you for shopping at Shaw's. When I check in to see my doctor, it's, can I have your blue card? <laughs> That's, of course, in man's greatest hospital. <laughs> but one of the major ways we demonstrate disrespect that we all really talk about ingrained and baked in, et cetera, is waiting. We all wait. Patients wait, we wait. Millions, billions of human hours wasted every year in doctors' waiting rooms. And it's all unnecessary. There are clinics, there are offices, there are emergency rooms, there are operating rooms, you name it, where they have zero waiting. Virginia Mason built a new building and has no waiting rooms in it because of course we don't need them. When patients come in, they go directly to the room and they get taken care of and so forth. Um, and this is a huge problem. And it's, it's totally, un it's right up there with, you know, I had the vision and so forth. We know how to do this. The guy, there, there are probably a dozen people in this room who are experts at this. I mean, this is part of industrial engineering, operations research, et cetera, queuing theory, you know, all, you know all the buzzwords. But the point is we, we, we could eliminate weight, essentially eliminate weight. We do have clinics that, that say if you aren't seen within 10 minutes, uh, I'm not sure what they do, they don't pay them $100, but they should. But anyway, uh, it's possible to uh, do all that. So here we are, three different kinds, very different, very different in terms of their impact and uh, very different in terms of what we need to do about it. And so I want to just reemphasize, I think we have a culture that teaches, tolerates, and rewards disrespectful treatment of everybody um, and that it is the root cause of the poor quality and safety, and of the dissatisfaction and lack of joy and meaning that people find in their work. And uh, unless we deal with this, we're not gonna be able to do what you and I all wanna do, which is to really make healthcare safe. You gotta get at the root cause. Um, I may be wrong, but after thinking about this for 20 years, I'm really convinced this is it. It's tough, it, it, it's not easy, but it's something we've got to quit, uh, quit uh, pretending it's not there. That's why I call it the elephant in the room. It's such an obvious big problem and nobody wants to talk about it. So let me just ask, uh, stop talking for a minute anyway, and say, what do you think are the reasons that we are disrespectful? If we're gonna do something about it, we better have some idea why, why it happened. So what do you think are the causes of this? I have ideas, of course, but what are your ideas? Lack of team training. So the typical medical student, uh, less so for nursing, by the way, because they do learn team, some team training, but medical students are usually not taught anything about team training 
in medical school, it's all the emphasis is on the individual. And, uh, and so and then they get into a hospital and then the question is how much training they get then. And usually they're so busy trying to get the test, lab test done and so forth, it goes by the board. So clearly lack of training in basic uh, 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 collaborative work. Yep. Yes. Hierarchy. Hierarchy. We have a hierarchical autocratic system built on doctor knows best. I'm a surgeon, we're the captain of the ship. And that's what the patient wants because, of course, they expect the doctor to fix them and to make sure everything goes right. So you just do what I tell you and everything will be fine. The heck with this team stuff. Um, I'm, I'm in charge here. Right. And we teach that, don't we? We teach that very strongly. Yes? Uh, in, in addition to just the, the lack of team training, I think the educational system selects people who don't work well. Very interesting. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, the selection process for medical school, I've never seen a place where it says good team player. Uh, maybe some do, in all fairness. Um, things may have changed since I've been out of it for a while. But it's usually, it's the science grade point average. And uh, you know, whether they think this person, they passed organic chemistry, which shows that they have perseverance. It doesn't, you don't need to know organic chemistry, but the fact that you can pass organic chemistry means that you will commit yourself to doing things when you don't have immediate rewards. Uh, so we select on other characteristics. We do not select on, uh, on uh, the interpersonal skills, and certainly teamwork is part of that, right? Uh, yeah. Um, the fact that nurses and doctors don't train together. They don't train together. They're, they're taught to be part of warning camp. And that's, that's part of the teamwork. So if you're going to have team training, in medical school, they had to have medical students and student nurses and student pharmacists all working together, at least some of the time, I mean, you know. Yeah, and they don't. I mean, there are now a few, but not very many. So, so they not only don't have team training, they don't have team experience, which is, I guess, what we're saying, which helps it become normal, yes. Uh, role models and the, and the informal curriculum. Exactly, the hidden curriculum, uh, as, as some people say. Right, uh, the role, uh, I mean, someone, uh, I'm sorry, I. I should remember who it is, but I have trouble remembering my wife's name, much less this. Uh, somebody once said that, the, that uh, imitation isn't the main way we learn behavior, it's the only way. And if there, if there, are no, there are no more capacious sponges in the world than a third year medical school student going on to the ward who now is ready to be a doctor and I'm going to be like him or her. I'm going to be like them. And so them, treats people with auto autocratically, with disrespect. Well, that's the way you do it. That's the way you become a good doctor. It, 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 it changes in nine months. From July to uh, March, it, it's all over. They become cynics. It's really quite impressive how quickly. Okay, other thoughts? Yes? We don't learn how to we don't learn how to communicate well. And so again, that, that's something, those are skills you can learn. I mean, some of us have them naturally better and so forth, but you can certainly learn that. So we, um, so our disrespect, we teach it. Somebody said we tolerate it, and that's certainly true, especially if you're powerful and bringing a lot of money. Uh, you don't get reprimanded. And, but I would suggest that maybe we also cause it by our environment. That the conditions under which people work agreed with some fu funny ideas about status and, and privilege and agree without training and teamwork and a few things like that. But we then put them in a pressure cooker and uh, it's not too surprising that sometimes they behave badly. So let me ask you that question. Why is it that so many doctors and nurses are unhappy? Well, you know the answers uh, and this is, this is really very pervasive. There, there are almost no nurses, almost no nurses that go home in less than nine hours, and usually it's 10 or 11. There are almost no, well, I can't, uh, I can't say almost no, but there's certainly a huge number of doctors who work 12-hour days and, and more, uh, and people are totally being drowned with the, the need to uh, follow pro practices and keep records, and everybody's telling them what to do. There's no slack, there's no downtime, there's no time to enjoy, there's no time to sit down and spend a half an hour with the patient saying, what's it like? Um, so we create an environment that makes it very difficult for people and it's kind of interesting to look at this because uh, one of the things we've all noticed in the last 10 years or so has been an increase in the number of financial incentives to do various things, either 
rewards or punishments for meeting certain criteria, et cetera. And there's even, uh, I think, one of the most invidious practices I know called tiering, where doctors are, uh, where, and where patients are required to pay a copay that goes up uh, as the doctor's rating goes down. So if they go to the doctor's uh, rating A, they pay $5. If the doctor's rated B, they pay 10. And if the doctor's rated C, they pay 20. Now, I don't know what's more insulting or disrespectful than that. But anyway, we have that kind of a system going on. And it goes way back to the Industrial Revolution and what happened in the 20th, 19th century when people began working on Henry, well, Henry Ford was in the 20th century, but you know what I mean, on, on production lines. And uh, Taylor and some other people studied all this, and they found that you could increase production by giving incentives. And so if you produce 20 widgets an hour instead of 15, I'll pay you an extra dollar an hour, et cetera. And we have all accepted that financial incentives make a lot of sense, and they work. There's no question that you, if you pay more for more widgets, you get more widgets. Uh, there are those who think medicine's a little bit more than making widgets, but the fact of the matter is that mindset is very much there. And that's in spite of the fact that for 50 years, actually more, 1950, Detchi and others began to show that extrinsic motivation like that is highly dangerous, that it actually extinguishes, um, I'm not ready for that, extinguishes creative thinking, uh, it takes away intrinsic motivation. Uh, and if there's ever a group of people in the world, uh, doctors and nurses have got to be the most highly intrinsically motivated piece of people you know. They're there because they want to uh, help people. They're there because they want to use their knowledge and talents to, to make the world a better place and to help folks. So they have a tremendous amount of intrinsic motivation, and we beat it out of them. And we, 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 we downplay it and we crush it. And my thing on this was altered uh, uh, quite a bit by this book by Daniel Pink, um, now like <laughs> five years ago, seems like yesterday. Uh, I don't, have anybody, has anybody in the room read this, Drive? There's one. I, I recommend it. If, if first of all, it's a good read. He's, great, he's a great writer, so it's fun to read. Well, Pink has a very simple theory in that, it, well, first of all, it he says it's not his theory. He brings together all the information, uh, as I said, starting with Deci in the, in the 50s and since then, that shows that extrinsic motivation crushes uh, creativity and sense of worth, et cetera and then goes on to say that what people really want, um, the, the things that motivate us intrinsically are autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy meaning that whatever I'm doing, whether I'm the neurosurgeon who knows more than anybody, or whether I'm the guy that sweeps the floor, that I want to have some control over my life. I want to have something to say about what I do, when I do it, how I do it, with whom I do it. And and it's possible to give that kind of autonomy to everybody in varying degrees. Uh, the second is that everybody has a desire for mastery. We like to do something well. We like to think we're, we're there's something we, maybe we're not the best in the world, but we're, we're really pretty good at this. And so a sense of mastery gives you a sense of, uh, of accomplishment, a sense of self that's important. And then right together with that is purpose, that, that what we're doing is more than just making a buck, that, that, that we really, uh, that what we do has some higher purpose. And again, we have this in spades in medicine because clearly what we do is so important. And we are, we are blessed at being able to go home and know that we've helped other people. Most people who work can't say that. So D Pink says that the challenge then is how do we build this into everyday work for everybody? And uh, I would suggest that there's a lot to be said for that. I'm also running out of time. So let me just make this real quick. What can you do next Tuesday, as Don Berwick would say? Um, when you go home, I think you have to, to ask yourself a serious question about whether you can get your CEO involved to do something about that. And I would suggest there are three things that ought to be on your agenda that are sort of the easy hits right up front. The first is to solve the disruptive doctor problem. This is the easiest one. It's not, it may not be easy to accomplish, but it's easy to know what needs to be done because there are places that have done it. And there are protocols, the Ontario College of Physicians and, Sur and Surgeons, Vanderbilt University, uh, various places that have published quite detailed protocols of what you do to manage this kind of a problem. And it is absolutely crucial because you're going to get nowhere with trying to create a respectful environment if you have egregious, flagrant, uh, uh, dis uh, disrespectful conduct that is, that is allowed and, as we said, sometimes 
sometimes rewarded. So this is the first thing that has to be done. You have to, the, the, the CEO has to get the top leadership together to agree to do something about it and then set up a process. Now, every hospital has a process for disruptive doctors because the Joint Commission requires it, but they don't follow it and it doesn't mean anything. And so we're talking about one that really means something and that's enforced. And uh, that requires a, a total alignment at the, at the top. One little hint, and that is the best way to make this happen is to have it in the contract that a person signs when they are hired. So that when they are when they're not behaving properly, you can say, you know, this is what we require here, and you sign this, and sort of shape up or ship out, and et cetera. But the point is, they, 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 they can, anybody can sue anybody, but they're not going to win on a suit if you've got a contract that says this in it. So the first step is to get it in your contract and then do something about it. Um, clearly, we need to enforce the rules. We need to say, um, if, if we say that everybody just infects their hands before they go in the room, then everybody just infects their hands before they go in the room. Now, if you forgot, that's an error, and we'll, we'll forgive you for that. But if you deliberately don't do it, I'm sorry, that's not acceptable and you do it another time, and we're gonna suggest you look for employment elsewhere. Now, I don't know of a hospital that's fired a doctor for not washing his hands, but it's about time they do. It's about time they do. There is no other walk of life where flagrant, flagrant, overt, conscious disregard of rules is tolerated. It's time for us, if we're serious about safety, it's time for us to get tough. There's no excuse for people working in a hospital who refuse to get a flu vaccination. You don't wanna get a flu vaccination? Fine, you just can't work here. I mean, let's stop the screwing around, folks. Let's get serious about this. Let's say safety is really important, and we mean it. And it's time to do that. So that's the leadership issue, isn't it? And then, of course, the basic issues of how we change the environment to do the autonomy and purpose and mastery. Let me finish with, can I run over another minute? <laughs> I want to tell you about Paul O'Neill. Uh, one of the great joy, joys of my life has been getting to know Paul O'Neill because he's a member of the Lucian Leap Institute, which we feel very privileged to have him. And Paul O'Neill, for those of you that don't remember, was the president of Alcoa, the largest aluminum manufacturer in the world, 41 plants around the world, et cetera. Housed in Pittsburgh, where uh, I grew up, and uh, some of us were from. And uh, uh, Paul O'Neill, uh, when he took over at Alcoa, said, uh, I want to make this the safest uh, company in the world. And the people said, well, we already, we're the safest of all the aluminum manufacturers. We have a much lower in injury rate than anybody else. He said, you don't get it. I want none. I want zero. I don't want anybody hurt. Well, it's going to be very expensive. Don't tell me how much it costs. We're going to do it. And he did. And uh, over a period of 15 years, this was his lost days of injury, due, due, lost days due to injury rate. And you can see it went down, down, down. And by the time he left, Alcoa had the lowest worker injury rate of any company in the world, beating out DuPont, which was the legendary safety uh, uh, leader. And so you ask Paul, well, you know, how, how, how do you really do that, aside from just saying it's important, which of course is the first, most important thing. And he said, well, he says, you know, he says, I believe that when people come to work every day, they should be able to, to say three things. I'm treated with dignity and respect by everyone, regardless of position, education, or pay. I have the support I need to make a contribution that gives meaning to my life. I am recognized and thanked for what I do. Respect, support, and appreciation. Now, you may think that's idealistic. That comes from a very hard-nosed, successful, big-time businessman. And I would suggest to you that's exactly what we need to achieve in our healthcare organizations. An environment where everybody feels every day they're treated with respect, they're supported, and they're appreciated. And I will finish with the aphorism that we all learned as medical students from Francis Weld Peabody, a distinguished a physician at the turn of the 19th century, who said, the secret of the care of the patient is caring for the patient. And I would merely make a little modification I think that's certainly true. In addition, I would say the secret of the care of the patient is also caring for the caregiver. And if you want to do something about improving safety in your institution, start by improving safety for the people who work there. Thank you very much. It's your time. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to be respectful of you and your time, but no. I wonder if you would entertain us with. If you have the time, I'm happy, and I enjoy taking questions. It helps me learn. So we have time for two or three questions, if people would. So why is it that it appears that I work uh, as a bedside nurse as well as doing other things, but? Why is it that it appears so difficult to get the feeling from management that you're cared for? Like, and how, why is it so difficult to engage them in this process of change? Well, uh, there, there's obviously no simple answer to that, but I think that it, the, 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 big, the big picture answer is, this is, the way, this is the way we develop, this is the way we are. So healthcare organizations, hospitals in particular, um, first of all, they were founded by doctors to ta have, have somebody take care of their patients. Uh, they, they weren't founded for patients, they were founded for the convenience of the physicians. And they are organized that way and have traditionally been organized. Every, everybody comes to work figuring out how they're going to get their job done. Uh, people don't think in terms of the patient experience, they think of their experience. And that's, that's human nature, I mean, that, that's true in any walk of life and there's nothing intrinsically wrong with, you know, my job is to get these tests done and get these forms filled out and get the, and, uh, and so we have not, we have not at any level put the value on the patient experience that we need to. One of the big efforts, one of the, the most recent effort of the Lucian Leaf Institute was on patient engagement. We just published a white paper uh, actually in March this year that's, that's available free on the National Patient Safety Foundation uh, webpage as are all our former monographs on patient engagement in which we convened experts around the country a couple times and wrote a white paper about what the issues are and what to do and so forth. But the essence of it is that, is that the, the, the ideal patient experience, what we would all want as patients is to be true partners in our care and have everybody really interested in, in helping us get to where we want to get. And uh, we need to work on that. We, we, everything, all the tradition is against that. Having said that, nurses particularly are often very caring people. I mean, they are, they are the ones that, that make the, ex when you go to the hospital, your experience is determined by the nurses. And certainly my experience, my wife's and friends, are, has j almost always been very positive. I think nursing across the board is very good at the one-on-one -on -one caring. It's the, it's the apparatus that doesn't care. It's the blue card bit. It's the, the doctors that never have time and so forth. But uh, it's so much built into just our institutionalism and that's what makes it so hard to change. I think. Yeah, that's leadership, that's leadership. The CEO has to, has to convince the C-suite and the department chairman that we want to be a different kind of organization. Leadership isn't telling people what to do, it's motivating them to want to do it. And, uh, and the leader has to get the top people to buy into being a different kind of organization. That's what Gary Kaplan did at, at Virginia Mason. They didn't all buy in, some left. Some just said, I don't want to be that way. He said, I'm really sorry, we'd like to have you here, but that's what, but, but they all got on the same page. And then Katie bar the door. I mean, it really works once you get there. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Le Mr. Leap, where, so where the, um, yeah. you said that uh, uh, residents, nurses, and a lot of the medical professionals are overworked, right? And that leads to um, uh, a bad working environment. What is the solution to improving that? Uh, where do you think the system needs to go uh, uh, to? Uh, improving what? I'm sorry, I didn't get it. Uh, to reduce the work hours for work, work uh, hours. medical professionals and so on. Wh what is the solution? Or well, it, uh, we know what the solution is. The question is how to get it to, to take place. I mean, it was not just Chuck Sizer and a lot of us people who thought this was a good idea. The, uh, the uh, Institute of Medicine had a big, uh, uh, a, a big round table on this, they published a book this thick about it in which they laid it all out and the Accreditation Council on graduate, graduate Medical Education said thank you very much and didn't do it. They did it for interns but not for other people and they're the ones that have the control over, over the residency. Now having said all that, uh, we, had a, we had a conference on this uh, about three years ago now in which we had a lot of people come together to talk about these issues and at that conference we had people who had done it. And so there are training programs in medicine, surgery, obstetrics, you name it, that have succeeded in rationalizing the hours 
and they find that the, the people are getting just as much experience and they're ending up doing better on their written exams and that kind of stuff. So it's clearly not detrimental to education. And so it can be done. Uh, one of the great tragedies is when the Accreditation Council said we're going to put in an hours restriction, everybody yawned. Nobody did anything to get ready for it. They th had three years advance notice and the vast majority of training programs in the country just hoped it would go away. And so the typical response was when, the day, when, it, when it came and the residents said, you know, I'm only supposed to work uh, 12 hours a day, or no more than 80 hours a week, and he said, fine, I understand, just as long as you get all your work done. And then, when the, and then they asked him to lie. Then they asked him to lie. Because the council would, would ask the residents to send in uh, 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 logs of their work. And, and, and they, weren't, they weren't told to falsify it, they were, they were just told this, that if your hours are more than, than are, you're supposed to be, there's a good chance our program will get, will get this accredited and of course you won't have a residency. I mean, this is, this is the level where it's at. Uh, the answer to your question is a, a few good men or women who will make it happen, and I think that is happening, but no, much too slow. A, a great place for regulation if you happen to, if you happen to be a regulator. <laughs> I'd do this in a, in a heartbeat. Oh, absolutely. No, they ought to apply to everybody. Oh, absolutely. The oh, yeah. Teachers. It isn't just student pilots that have to follow these hours, but the regular pilots on United Airlines have to follow those hours. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, no, no question about it. Everybody. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a black and white on this. Nobody should work more than 12 hours. Period. Stop. End of discussion. I'm sorry. That's it. I mean, there's evidence that, there's evidence that after about eight, you're deteriorating, and so 12 is a stretch, but I'm not going to fight that battle. Yep. So I wonder if we can go back to how you opened, right? Uh, which was in, in harm and in safety, you know, we know what to do and the problem is will. So I think you've presented quite a challenge here. Uh, uh, summarized the problem around respect and painted a roadmap, but that piece in the middle, that will, it, this seems to be a bigger challenge than the need for the will directly in terms of like implementing bundle elements. Are there the places we can start looking inside of healthcare, you know, we can point to Alcoa, we can point to uh, Kaplan and Lean, but around creating a culture of respect. Well, uh, I, I would go with the models. Uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's fascinating. Virginia Mason, I mean, you know, full disclosure, I think they're the best hospital in the world, and Gary Kaplan's a good friend, and so I'm far from unbiased. But the facts sort of bear me out. And LeapFrog has cited them as one of the best hospitals for 10 years in a row. But um, they, uh, three years ago, I think it was, they had me come out and spend a few days with them. And I said, what can I teach you guys? You, you're the ones that have written the book on this. I'm just, you know, I'm in an ivory tower. I haven't practiced medicine for 25 years. You want me to tell you? We want me to tell you how to practice it? Come on. They said, oh, come on. And I'm talking to her. So I came out and talked to her. And I gave this little talk, or, you know, a variant of it. And it really hit them. And they said, you know, we have a lot of that. And two weeks later, they got a committee together, and they developed a course on respect for people. And they put all 5,000 people through the course. That's what happens when you have a learning organization where the, the soil is fer ripe for, for the seeds to be planted. They just took it and ran with it. And I would suggest you're interested in that. Go out to Virginia Mason and see how they do it, or have, them, have one of them come to your meeting and talk about this. You're the, you're the future, you know. You have to make it happen. You have to change this. And you have to get your leaders to change. And one way is to get some, some, some good evidence from how to do it from people who know how. But I would, I would tap them. Cincinnati Children's uh, also, they, they're, they're quite, they're, they're available to do this. Thank you so much.